administration of magnesium prior to a heart attack or even during a heart attack would prevent and protect the heart muscle from forming destructive internal crystals. Wow, that's fascinating. This is mostly ignored or neglected by doctors when they're dealing with heart conditions. My grandfather died of a heart problem in his 50s. My father developed atrial fibrillation. Then he had an ablation where they destroyed the pacemaker of the heart. And now he's on permanent medication. So because heart problems run in my family, I wanted to know everything there is to know about heart problems so I can then prevent it myself. And of course, share it with other people. There are four really common heart problems out there. Number one, placking, where you get this inflammation, the body comes as a Band-Aid, starts forming calcium and cholesterol deposits. The artery becomes obstructed. You no longer get oxygen to the heart muscle. Your heart muscle cramps. You get angina, which is a lack of oxygen, and then you get a heart attack. Number two is blood clots. This is different because now you're getting a blood clot that gets lodged in the heart, obstructing the artery, which you then also get a lack of oxygen, and you could potentially get a heart attack. Or if it mobilizes throughout the rest of the body, it can end up in your brain, you can end up getting a stroke. Number three, we can get atrial fibrillation. And so in this condition, you get pooling in certain parts of the heart or the vascular system, and then you can get a clot that develops and that can turn into a heart attack. And then number four, you have hypertension, high blood pressure, okay? In this situation, you have this high level of pressure that can make the arteries very stiff, harden. And if you have chronic hypertension, that really destroys the kidney as well because the kidneys cannot tolerate that much pressure for a long period of time. Now, what's fascinating is all four of these problems involve this one common thing, a magnesium deficiency. Now, the very interesting thing about a magnesium deficiency is that it's almost impossible to test. When you check the magnesium in your blood, you're only looking at 1% of your body's magnesium. The great majority of magnesium, 99%, is inside the cells, not in your blood. This is why a magnesium blood test is not a reliable way to know if you have magnesium or not. Now, if we just take a step back, and look at some of the common medications for the heart and how they work and the mechanisms, they directly relate to magnesium. So let's start with the medications called the calcium channel blockers. Okay, these calcium channel blockers, now what are those? Well, they block calcium. Now, why would you wanna take a medication that blocks calcium? Too much calcium in the wrong place can cause too much contraction. So it's the calcium that causes the contraction and the magnesium that causes the relaxation. So magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker without the side effects that some of these drugs create. What a lot of doctors don't know is that magnesium regulates calcium. Any condition you have where there's too much calcium, think magnesium. I mean, even in other symptoms, if you have this like little tetany or twitching, that's too much calcium because I don't have enough magnesium. All right, let's look at another type of medication, beta blockers. Beta blockers block adrenaline, relaxing the arteries, allowing more blood flow to the heart muscle. And they also use them for heart rhythm problems as well. Well, did you know that magnesium naturally lowers adrenaline and cortisol? This is why so many people take magnesium before they go to bed so they can sleep and they can feel relaxed. Number three, warfarin. This is the medication that my father's on because he had atrial fib, and then they put a pacemaker, they wanna make sure that there's no extra clotting going on. So you cannot have any foods with high vitamin K1 because that creates clotting and they're trying to keep his blood thin. Now, what's interesting about this whole clotting mechanism is that calcium is involved in clotting. And so, like I said before, magnesium helps control the excess calcium. And number four, you have a lot of different medications to help lower blood pressure. The arteries have a layer of muscle and magnesium is a natural vasodilator. This is why magnesium helps people with high blood pressure. Why don't more doctors use magnesium when treating the heart? Well, number one, it's almost impossible to test. Number two, they're not taught nutrition in school. They get like 12 to 24 hours of nutrition training in an entire medical school. And the other really interesting thing is a lot of this research on magnesium is mixed as far as what it can do for the heart. A lot of the studies are done with a type of magnesium that you only absorb three to 4% of the magnesium. They're using magnesium oxide. So if you're taking like, I don't know, 400 milligrams and you're only absorbing three to 4%, are you really gonna see any results? Chances are no. Versus another type of magnesium is magnesium glycinate where you absorb 80%. And that's gonna reduce greatly your chance of getting a kidney stone. Now, 
I personally had a kidney stone. It was so severe. I told my wife, finally understand the pain of what you went through giving birth. She strongly objected to that. She said, you have no idea what it's like to be pregnant. I agreed. And I was magnesium deficient at that time. I wish I would have known about magnesium because that is the ultimate antidote. Now, what about the calcium building up in your arteries, right? Have you ever heard of the coronary artery calcification test? It's a good test to do to be able to see how much calcium you have in your arteries. It's relatively inexpensive and it's a great predictor of mortality. Now, in other videos, I talk about another vitamin involved with keeping calcium out of the arteries, and that would be vitamin vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is dependent on magnesium to work. Now I want to shift to something very interesting about a heart attack. When you, someone has a heart attack and the oxygen that supplies the heart muscle is diminished or cut off, that's called ischemia, you then get a precipitation of calcium crystals. Now, when you think precipitation, you probably think it's raining from the clouds, right? Well, just think about calcium crystals coming out of something that are going right into the heart muscle itself. These crystals, which can be seen here, gather within the mitochondria. The mitochondria generates energy by using oxygen. These crystals cause irreversible damage to the heart tissue itself. Here we see large calcium crystals visible by the naked eye grown in a Petri dish. These crystals have the same general shape as the ones that can be seen microscopically within the tiny structures of the mitochondria of patients who suffered a heart attack when the oxygen supplied to the heart muscle was diminished or cut off. The next image shows a different outcome for patients who received magnesium prior or during a heart attack. Administration of magnesium prior to a heart attack or even during a heart attack would prevent and protect the heart muscle from forming destructive internal crystals. Wow, that's fascinating. I don't know if you've heard about this research that shows that when women take too much calcium, especially if they're menopausal, this also puts them at risk for heart attacks. Now you know why, because there's not enough magnesium to help regulate all this calcium that comes in the body. I would be very cautious about taking too much calcium. I would actually recommend trying to get your calcium from food. Now I talked before about magnesium relaxing muscles and calcium causing contraction, not just the arteries, not just the heart muscle itself, but in any muscle at all, including leg cramps. Now, I used to have leg cramps and foot cramps in the early morning, and I always wondered why. Magnesium is on a circadian rhythm. In other words, the lowest magnesium occurs in the early morning. So if you're going into this problem with a subclinical magnesium deficiency, so you're low, you're gonna start expressing some of the magnesium symptoms. Probably the most important function of magnesium is in what it does to energy. In other words, when you eat food, it gets digested, it goes into the cells, it goes into a specialized cell called the mitochondria. And our mitochondria actually burn off that energy until the last step of this whole chain involves a motor which is converting the inactive energy to the active energy. This is why when people are deficient in magnesium, they get tired, especially if they're exercising. If you're deficient in magnesium, another problem that you'll have is migraine headaches. And just as a side note with migraines, in order to get rid of some people's migraine headaches, you have to take more than even 400 milligrams. Then we get to another very important piece of this puzzle, and that is vitamin D3. If you don't have magnesium, vitamin D cannot work. Let's say, for example, you're taking a lot of vitamin D without magnesium. Guess what? You're not going to see the results. So just make sure if you take vitamin D, also take magnesium. So they both work together. I do want to mention how we become deficient in magnesium. There's a couple things. 48 to 57% of the population consumes less than the RDA. If you were to get your magnesium from bananas, you'd have to have 11 cups per day. Almonds are a good source of magnesium, like five ounces would give you enough, but the problem is it has oxalates, which create another problem. Then we have spinach is a good source of magnesium. You only need a, a one and a half cups, but of course spinach also has oxalates. Dark chocolate, six ounces would give you enough magnesium, but of course dark chocolate also has oxalates. And then avocados, you need seven cups, right? That's, that's quite a few. Fish, you need 15 ounces. 
Beef, you'd have to eat four pounds. Kale, four cups. But pumpkin seeds, 5.6 ounces. And sunflower seeds, 4.5 ounces. On the flip side, there are things that can deplete your magnesium. Alcohol, it'll deplete it. Refined sugar, starches. Also, certain genetics can create a problem with your ability to absorb magnesium. Stress, if you don't have enough stomach acid. Certain drugs, antibiotics, if you're doing whole grains, right? Out of all these things, the ultra processed foods, okay, highly refined foods, basically have virtually no nutrition at all, especially not magnesium. And so if we're digesting all these ultra processed foods, the demand for magnesium goes way up. I mean, even little toddlers, like two and under, consume 45% of their calories as ultra processed food. Teenagers consume 67% of all of their calories, ultra processed foods. Adults consume 57% of their calories as ultra processed food calories. So you can imagine how deficient in magnesium as a population we are. And like I mentioned before, one of the reasons why the doctors are not all over this is because in the literature, in the research, there's a lot of mixed reviews with magnesium. Well, if you really look deeper, they're using magnesium oxide. In a lot of these studies, which you're only gonna absorb a tiny bit and you're not gonna really see the results like you really should. Now at this point, I think it's really important to know the different types of magnesium and what they do. And for that information, you should watch this video right here.